Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Keith Hewlett, and I'm the Director of Business Development here at Ascent Geomatic Solutions. I'm joined today by our honorable and esteemed Mr. Michael Poole. Michael, you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm a civil engineer and a land surveyor. I graduated from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo with a bachelor's in civil engineering, and I am the engineering manager here at Ascent Geomatics. Excellent. So you know a little bit about land surveying then? Is that why you're here? Uh, that's the claim, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is the topic today. Uh, this is a recorded webinar, so I wanted to let everybody know that if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, just go to the orange arrow up in the top right-hand corner, hit, on, hit that button, and then you should see an area there for questions, and you can submit those. We'll answer any of the questions at the end of this session. Uh, today's topic is going to be Land Surveying 101. And we'll get our slides to advance here. Here we go. Uh, so what the, the idea behind this today is there's a lot of folks that maybe are just coming new into their industries. Maybe it might be oil and gas. It could be in the civil infrastructure or transportation space. So we wanted to do this for a number of different reasons. One was just to give some of those folks a... Uh, an idea about what land surveying is, and then another is to really kind of teach even folks that have been working with land surveying, maybe sub out some of these services to understand a little more about the background and why land surveying isn't as easy as some people may claim it to be, because it's certainly not. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right in, Michael. Uh, maybe you could explain to me, let's start very basic here, and just explain what is land surveying. Land surveying, in a nutshell, is the locating features spatially on the Earth's surface. Um, that's the, the simple terms, just where is something? Okay. Where is it in relation to something else? Is it looking at vertically, horizontally? How, what is it, how does that all factor in? Uh, yeah, where is it uh, located on the Earth's surface? And we try and do that in, in a number of ways, either from a, a particular location that we might call a control point or from um, with GPS technology today we use latitude and longitude so we've got the equator of the earth and um, the prime meridian uh, of out there in England. Okay and so I've been on a plane I'm sure you've been on a few planes in your day and as you're flying over, you see these pictures that look basically like this picture on the left here. It looks like a huge grid system. Uh, tell me a little bit about, about that and why that is such a perfect kind of a grid system. Well, it's certainly not perfect, but that, that was the aim many, many years ago. But yeah, you, you're flying over that. And even when I was flying as a kid, what are all these squares? Why does it look like a big checkerboard down there? And um, Thomas Jefferson, way back in the 1700s, he knew that, you know, that we were going to be expanding and everything, and, and he had the forethought to, that, hey, we need some kind of system of laying out this land and, and subdividing it. So that was sort of the, the birth of that, and we came up with the public land surveying system in the 1800s. Great, and I think we're going to talk about that in a little more depth here, but so this isn't by accident. This, uh, this looks this way for a reason. Yes. Okay. All right. So how did we get here? Um, you know, looking at, obviously, there's, there's a long history that kind of goes along with land surveying, right? This isn't something that's a new concept. Sure, we use new tools today, but this is not a new concept. Uh, even Thomas Jefferson, when he laid out this system, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, it wasn't even new to Thomas Jefferson, right? This is something that's been going on for a very long time, right? Thomas Jefferson was a surveyor himself before he was president, and uh, you know, surveying actually goes back all the way to the Egyptians. The, the pyramids didn't just happen. They, they had some, uh, some really smart people and some sophisticated tools, and, and that's how the pyramids got built. Sure. Well, I, I, pretty much anything, right? I mean, if you look at the bottom right-hand picture, that's the uh, seven ancient wonders of the world. You don't build structures like that thousands of years ago unless you've got some way to build it. I mean, you know, you look at the pyramid, there's two and a half million blocks in that. There's no way that you're going to put two and a half million blocks at 20 tons 
And if it's off by inches or, or a foot, that's going to make a really big difference on the other side of that pyramid. So they had to have some sort of a way to, to do that, right? Absolutely. So how did they do it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's obviously a big mystery, but uh, it's a surveying seminar, not, uh, yeah, well, I know. not engineering. Well, they could, uh, I think maybe they use water. I think I've heard that's the technique that they use and uh, uh, a lot of different types of methods. But either way, uh, throughout time it's been used and then here in the U.S. and America, obviously we know George Washington was a surveyor, uh, Thomas Jefferson was, and then I guess, help me out with this, but was it not right after the Louisiana Purchase um, that we started to kind of as we were moving and expanding west, that we started to put in this system of the PLSS system to break up these different areas? Yeah, you, um, the original 13 colonies, those were all done by what's called meets and bounds. It's just like, um, you know, go along a fence till you get to a tree, then you follow this uh, line of rocks until you get to this uh, other tree. Um, and that just wasn't is simple. So, yeah, they wanted something that was going to be a little more distinct and uh, easily easier to follow. And those are still in place in a lot of different states, right? The meets and bounds. I know in Texas they still use that. Uh, Texas is a little bit different. They've had uh, four or five different countries that have owned that land. You had France and then the Spaniards and then Mexico and then the Republic of Texas and now finally the United States. So. Uh, lots of different ways that they've doled out land down there. So there was some meets and bounds. There was some very similar to our sectionalized land. Um, but yeah, Texas is uh, is different. And then there's the 13 colonies that are still meets and bounds. Mm -hmm. And then the remainder of the United States, except for small portions of California and a few others, but uh, all PLSS, public land survey system. Okay. Well, let's talk about that then, this uh, PLSS that we keep mentioning, the public land survey system. So for a layman like me, uh, in layman's terms, how would you explain what the PLSS is? Uh, it's a, a way to subdivide the land, and it's broken down into sections, 640 acres, which turns out to be a mile by a mile. Uh, and then those are in townships of 36 sections, six by six. And, and then we have meridians all over the United States that uh, principal meridians that um, that those are all laid out by so we here in Colorado we're mostly in the sixth principal meridian mm -hmm. uh, other places North Dakota is the fifth uh, Montana has its own principal meridian uh, Montana New Mexico has its own well, I'm an expert on meridians, of course, but for anybody that might be listening, maybe you could just explain what you mean by a, a meridian. Uh, meridian is uh, it's a it's an arbitrary line that just goes through a point that, that somebody I don't know if they threw a dart at the board or what, but um, no, they they chose something obviously a little bit more specific than that, but uh, it sets out a baseline that um, we we talk about meridians north of a certain line or south of a certain line and east or west of a certain line. So those are the baselines and the meridians. The baseline runs east. It's a line that runs east-west and we measure north and south of it. And the meridian is um, a north-south running line that we measure east and west of. Okay. All right. So again, just kind of recapping the PLSS here. So you've got a township, right? And the township will house 36 sections. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And then each section is going to be 640 acres. Is that correct? Ideally, yes. And then ultimately that section can be broken down a little bit further, right? So we can look at, here's an example of uh, a section there in that you can see the 36 sections down in that graphic in the middle. And then to the top right, you can see that section broken down. So then you start to get into a quarter and a quarter quarter and it just continues to break down, right? Yep. Uh, that was the whole idea behind it was that, you know, if somebody wants an entire section of land or they just want a quarter of a section, um, maybe they buy a quarter and then they have three kids and then, you know, in their will, they dole that out by quarter quarters, just kind of, you know, they keep subdividing from there. Okay. And, and as you can see there on a couple of the bullet points, we talked about this, you know, being done back in the late 1700s. And they did one one and a half billion acres. 
I would have loved to get that contract. Breaking down one and a half billion acres, that would have been nice, huh? Well, yeah. <laughs> We're going to start tomorrow. Yeah, great. Well, so, um, so let's talk a little bit more about um, kind of this township section, also range, right? So you hear that a, a lot, is township section range. So how does range factor into this? Uh, range, well, there you can see there's that uh, principal meridian and the baseline that I was talking about. So, um, so we call those townships, those 36 sections. So as we measure away from the baseline and the meridian, we'll say um, township 9 north, range 68 west. Mm -hmm. So that's nine towns, nine lines north of the baseline and six, what did I say, 68? Eight. 68 um, away from the meridian. So that's, uh, i not sure where the, the range came from, but, um, that's the, the township and range, and then we'll narrow it down to a specific section within that township. Here you see uh, township two south, range three west, and section 14. Right, okay, and this really narrows down the area, and then each one of these um, corners is gonna have some sort of a, a monument in place. I think we'll talk about monuments here in a minute, right? Yeah, they, they went out and supposedly, I mean, this was back in the 1800s, 1860s, Mm -hmm. 50s and such, um, but they put stones or some charred stakes, things like that. Okay, and so where we see the PLSS in place today, obviously a good portion of the U.S. is mapped in this way, but as you mentioned earlier, the 13 original colonies and then Texas is kind of its own animal. There's a lot of different methods, a lot of different systems used over the years. Uh, but a majority of the U.S. is still is using this type of a system. Yep, everything you see in blue, uh, like I said, except for a few areas in California and then the uh, lot of, some of the reservations um, is all PLSS. Sure. Okay. Makes sense. So, again, if we're talking about history here, obviously they weren't using GPS and drones, I imagine, back in uh, early 1800s, right, as they were going out and surveying. So They wished they were. <laughs> so these are some of the tools you probably used early uh, in your career. Maybe you could tell us about what some of these are. I'm not that old. <laughs> Thank you. <Keith. laughs> um, so the, the what you see on the the right there, I have to get my bearing straight. Is uh, it's an old Gunter's chain, and that's how the original sections were were laid out. There's a hundred of these little links on there, and um, that made 66 feet for one chain, and then 6.6 uh, .6 feet for a link, and that's how those were all laid out, was using those chains and then just some guy making sure he stayed online. Um, pretty cool stuff. And then uh, an old transit there in the middle, you know, that's how we, we in the ancient days, we turned angles and um, there might even be a little star guide there on the top too, so you can take measurements off of Polaris. And then just an old compass wow. on the left. It's actually pretty incredible if you think about it. The fact that they were able to get to put in place this grid system as good as they they did with these types of tools. I mean, you think about what we use today, and obviously GPS and things like that. But that's pretty amazing that they were able to do that with these these types of in in a way primitive kind of tools as we look at them today. Um, absolutely, and it's amazingly accurate how well they did out there. And they're sleeping out there in tents, right? I mean, they're they're going across this land, uh, sleeping out there with the elements and the animals and all that other stuff too. That that would have been a and the Indians, sure. The Native Americans would have certainly uh, been a been a challenge. So yeah, that would uh, that would have made surveying a little bit tougher back in the day, huh? Yep. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, we've talked about kind of the history of what is land surveying, where did it come from. Um, but now let's switch gears and kind of talk about who needs or who uses land surveying today. What, why would you have to have land surveying? It's got to locate things. Got to figure out where they are on the Earth's surface. I mean, that's that's the whole basis of land surveying is finding these things spatially and, and where am I? You are here. You're that red dot on the map. So you're going to use this for if you're going to put in place a new building, you're going to put in place a new house, you're going to put in place a new oil and gas pad, you're going to put in place a new highway. 
anything, is it a fair statement to say that anything that's going to be built uh, would need to have some sort of land surveying included? Anything that's going to be built, uh, any large purchases, large real estate purchases, or uh, a refinance or something like that, um, the, the lender might require a survey. Where is, like I said, it's all spatial. Where is the thing that I'm going to finance? Or where is the thing that you want to buy? It's not being built, but you know they want to know where it is and, and relative to other stuff around it to make sure that you know the the neighbor next door is not going to have some kind of claim to this property that I'm helping you buy. Sure. Yeah, I think we're going to talk about that in a minute too. You know what some of those repercussions could be, but um, essentially anybody that's getting new property, building on that property anything like that. There has to be some sort of land surveying, right? Because we need to ensure that, that it's accurate where we're actually going to lay that building, put that house, put that oil and gas pad, things like that, right? Yep, you bet. And so as an example, you know, everyone's familiar, these would be an example of, um, you know, part of an, an exhibit package that would get put in place where the surveying has actually been done. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what this depicts here. Uh, on the right side is a well location certificate, so we're going out and we're telling the operator, here's your, where you want to put a hole in the ground and get some black sludge out and relative to that section. This is where it is and this is what's required by the, the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission. And then on the left side is a, is a grading plan, you know, the, the surveyor went out there and said, here's the topography of the ground and here's how we're going to grade this so that they can put a rig on there. You okay. have something flat so the thing doesn't fall over. So on the right, obviously, there's uh, regulations that the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission has put in place saying that you have to be a certain distance from a building or, or, or other types of uh, units, right? But a building unit being a very important one, like someone's house. So this would ensure that they are within those regulations on the right side, right? Making sure that, that you're abiding by all the, the rules and regulations of the COGCC. Uh, from a, a very macro point of view, sure. that one, yes. And then on the left side is, is you know, gathering that topography. You obviously want to lay these pads as flat as you can get, and that's what that grading plan and the, the cut fill is. You, you hear those terms, meaning this is how much ground we need to cut out, this is how much ground we need to fill in in order to make that a flat surface, right? And yeah. obviously that's very important, especially in a place like Colorado where there's quite a, quite a bit of uh, different undulations in the, in the earth, and there's it goes all the way up to 14,000 plus and um, obviously down to 5,000, right? Yeah, around three or 4,000. Does it? Does it go down once you get out of East? Yeah, sure. Okay, so there's some huge variations there, and so that's really important. So, you know, when we talk about when is land surveying needed, uh, you know, we talked about kind of when, why or who would actually use these type of services, anybody that's going to be kind of building this, but when is it actually needed? So you can see this list here, planning, designing, construction, as built, uh, and demolition. Uh, maybe you could just really quickly touch on each one of these very quickly, how land surveying you know, factors into each one of these five on the left side there. Uh, well, when you're planning something, you know, a land developer wants to go out and build a big massive subdivision, say, he wants to know what's the rough area that I've got to, to, to build on, how many homes can I roughly get on there, and he's just trying to get an idea, or is it worth it for me or not to can I make some money on this and then um, you get into the designing phase you've gone out and figured out what the lay of the land is and and said all right here is the boundary of the area that you purchased to do all of this and so they, they get down into more nitty-gritty they start designing roads and, and actual lots for these buildings um, and then you get in the construction phase you can go out and you can stake out these roads that some engineer designed for them and, and Here's where the building needs to be, the house on each one of these lots and the driveways and all the utilities. Uh, then the as-built phase, after everything's constructed, it's good to go out and, all right, here's how we designed it, how close did they get to the design, and if we need to go back later, um, what, what actually got put into the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the demolition phase, um, you want to rework something, you, um, they want to homeowner doesn't like his house or it gets blown over or whatever and, and they need to demo and then come back and, and build something new and, and that one can even go back into the planning phase. What do I got to, there's a, an old barn out there that I need to get rid of. 
and, and that'll get located in the in the planning phase. And survey would be involved in pretty much each one of these phases. Every single one. Yeah. Okay. So I know we we briefly mentioned this earlier, but you know when you're talking about you know why is land surveying so important? Uh, you know there's a number of different reasons. We've listed a few of them here on the left, but you know tell us why land surveying is needed. So let's say you're going to build a building, um, you're in your planning or your design phase, and you just decide, you know what, we're going to save a few bucks. Uh, let's not do land surveying. What are the potential repercussions? Well, the potential repercussions, you might uh, not build on the land that you thought was yours because you didn't have somebody go out there and figure out where your land is. Uh, what happens if that happens? What happens if you end up building on land that's not yours and you go over a boundary that now is somebody else's? Uh, you, you get an angry landowner, an angry adjacent landowner, and he's going to take you to court and make you either tear it down or he's going to say, well, it's on my land, now that, that portion of that is mine. Mm -hmm. And so, both of those options sound pretty expensive when you compare it to just using a uh, land surveyor on the front end to gather this data. Yeah, when you spend millions of dollars on a on a single building, you want to make sure that it's all on your property. Sure. Unless you make an agreement with the guy next door. Right. Um, you know, you, you want to know exactly what your terrain looks like so that um, you don't have, maybe you don't want to bring in a whole bunch of dirt to to, to grade on this thing, you want to try and balance things. If you don't have a surveyor go out there and, and get the topography for you, um, you're not going to be able to grade it accurately. So that's kind of the first bullet point there, right? Understand what is actually there. I mean, there if there's too much uh, grading that occurs, there's too much construction, cut and fill, that could get very expensive, right? And maybe that's not the ideal place to, to put that new mall or to put that new building or movie theater, right? Yeah. Um, so, Understanding what is there, and then understanding how to build it. Obviously, you know, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, how does that factor in? Is that you know, putting in these stakes that we see when we drive by these open lots every once in a while? Yeah, I mean, the the engineering that goes into the construction plans for any any project, there, there's a lot that goes into it, and if you don't put it into the ground correctly, you know, all of the the expensive work that went into that it was is for nothing, you know, and we want to make sure that water flows downhill to the places it's supposed to go. And if you don't have a surveyor come in and, and stake it out for you, um, it may, who knows where it'll go. And then you get things start flooding and the person that bought that property, then they're not happy because their property just flooded. And I, I think most of the folks that might be listening to this, they can understand, especially if they've worked with surveying in the past, they understand that this is a needed thing, right? I mean, people, generally speaking, they shouldn't or wouldn't not use surveying on the front end of this and all the way through the process because it is extremely costly and the project timelines could just get uh, completely thrown out, you know, if you don't understand exactly what you're doing. It's that accuracy of the information in knowing where you're going to build, why are you going to build it that way, how are you going to build it, all those factors that come in, right? So survey is a really important piece of that all the way through. And if you don't have that or it's not done accurately, that could be another problem, right? Yeah. Accuracy is huge. You know, like I was saying, if you don't put it in right, then water is going to flow where it's not supposed to go. Or um, you might put that fence line in the wrong spot. It, uh, accuracy is important. Well, let's talk, uh, let's switch gears a little bit here. Let's talk about uh, types of land surveying. So I know there's a lot of different types of land surveying, but some of the more common terms that you'll hear, like topographic type surveys or boundary surveyors or boundary surveys or construction surveys, as well, there's a lot of different ones. We've listed just kind of some of the more common ones here. If it's okay, I'd love to kind of talk through these a little bit more and, and maybe you could help educate our listeners here and myself on what do each one of these actually mean and why are they important? Okay. So uh, let's start with topographic surveys. So what is this? Why is it used? You know, how does it benefit the, the overall project? Well, topographic survey tells you what is the land look like, what's on the land, buildings, fences, roads, 
and what kind of vertical relief is there on the ground. You can um, see there on the left you've got contours which gives you lines of constant elevation and you can get a good idea three-dimensionally what that land looks like and where the lakes are. Um, and then on the, the right you've got uh, one that was done for a grading plan for an oil and gas pad. Okay, and so these topographic surveys, uh, these contours that you mentioned, again, for uh, in layman's terms, you know, when you're talking about contours, I can see all these squiggly lines there, but uh, what, what do those mean? I, I know you kind of mentioned that kind of shows the elevation, but uh, if they're closer together, what does that mean? Because we've seen some of these maps before. What happens if they're further away? So what, just describe what that means. So the closer together they are, the steeper the land, the farther apart they are, the the flatter the land. Okay. And so generally, if somebody's <coughs> building something and just from a planning phase, uh, they may want to look at like one foot contours. I, you know, you hear those terms. What does that mean when they're looking for one foot contours? One foot contours is just the interval between the contours on the map itself. Okay. They want you to measure within one one or to be able to say what's within one foot. Is that? They just want within a foot to know what the topography looks like. If there's something that's really flat, you might even give them half a foot contours or even down to a tenth. Sure. Just to, to give them a better idea of the, what's happening in between these one foot contours. If you got something really flat, you're not going to see a lot of relief within that area. And those other things you mentioned, roads, houses, things like that, um, are those what you would commonly refer to as features or? Is there other terms for that? Uh, I would generally call those features. That's what I like to call them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the topographic ultimately not only will tell you, show you the lakes or any types of drainage or things like that that might be around there, but also um, does that ultimately help you figure out what that cut and fill that we talked about earlier, like how much you're going to need to cut and fill to, and when you start grading out that area to make it flat? Yeah, you'll use uh, earthwork calculations to figure out how much cut and fill you're going to have, and um, you can even use those contours to give you a, an idea of where lakes or where streams are. Uh, to a trained eye, you can you can see where the the contours kind of make a point, and that's a sometimes can be a valley or a ridge. Okay. Okay. Great. So let's talk about another very common term that we talk, that we hear is section breakdown. So Explain what section breakdown is. Uh, what are you doing? Why is it important? Well, the, you know, we go back to we talked about the PLSS and that everything is broken down into sections. And a lot of times, land here in Colorado is described in terms of um, sections. Uh, at least the the rural areas, the, the urbanized, you know, where it's been subdivided even farther. But uh, you need to go out and you need to locate the corners of these one mile sections and then and sometimes even farther down than that, the quarter quarters. The, the, the surveyors back in the 1800s, they, they laid stones out or, or charred stakes or piles of rocks. Uh, they used all sorts of different methods, but they generally set them at the section corners and the quarter corners on the exteriors. And so why are you, why are you going out there and verifying that these monuments are there? Because that's section breakdown, right? It's ultimately going out and saying these monuments are here, right? Um, why do you need to verify that they're there? If they were put in there 200 years ago, why do we need to go back out and verify that those are there? Well, yeah, they were put in 200 years ago, but we didn't have any way to say here's exactly where it is. I mean, they were accurate, but they weren't that accurate, so um, nothing was exactly a mile, and a lot of our clients are oil and gas, and they have to know within a foot where their, ga where their oil well is mm -hmm. re relative to a section line. Well, let me give you another example. Let's say it's not 200 years ago. What if it was five years ago? Um, why would you still need to go out and verify that there is a monument on, on this corner um, of these four sections? Well, there's things like road construction happen. Uh, they repave a road or they pave a dirt road, uh, a cow gets hungry, uh, sometimes a landowner, some of these old limestone sandstones that they put out 
150 years ago. They're really pretty, and um, Ma Farmer wants to have them around her garden, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes they just get pulled out. So things like that, they're obliterated. We have to go back out and reestablish those corners. And how often, uh, you know, do you have to go out and reestablish or or verify that the monuments are there? Well, the verification we do it all the time, but reestablishing one anywhere. Roughly around 25% of the time, we have to reestablish a monument that's been lost or obliterated. Really? 25? What? So let's stop there just for a second. So what if you go out to, um, to to verify that there's a monument there and it's not there? What is the duty? What is the obligation um, from your perspective as a uh, either a PLS, your professional land surveyor, or as a company? Like, what's your obligation if you go out there to verify something's there and it's not there? Well, we have an obligation as a surveyor by Colorado State statute to reestablish that monument and, and the location of that. And we use various different methods. There's uh, lines of occupation. If there's a fence line, it, it makes it pretty obvious where that corner is. If there's a fence corner, we, we have to take into account road right-of-ways and things like that. Uh, there, there's other surveying methods, doing proportional methods that we can use to establish that corner again, and so I would imagine that that can that can make thing that can make a tough situation because the project itself that you may be working on may not necessitate that that you're going out and reestablishing an entire monument, right? But the Colorado statutes say yes, you should be doing that. So there is it fair to say that there could be a, a bit of a conflict there because. You know, the company you might be working for, they could care less, right? They just want an accurate survey. Um, but your license potentially could be on the line if you're not if you're not doing that, right? Correct. Yeah. So state law. State law. So there's that's a that's definitely got to be because I imagine that just to go reestablish a monument is as easy as that may sound. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds, is it? No. <laughs> there's, there's a lot more research goes into it. You actually have to expand your your survey to, to get additional monumentation or additional lines of occupation and that costs money you got to maybe do title research um, expand the survey this is all going to be more hours that go into that project that the client may say I didn't I don't want that I didn't pay for you to go do title research but unfortunately that's something that you have to do right yep well, this is a this is an important one. We've been talking about section breakdown for a few minutes here, but this is obviously a this can be an area of contention in some situations because this is a really tough deal. Um, uh, section breakdown is is anything but easy and anything but a known uh, you know certainty of what you're going to find out there, right? I mean, as we know, um, finding monuments can be a tricky task. Uh, you can see some of the images here. Of just looking at where where you're going to have to try and find monuments. Uh, tell me a little bit about this. I mean, what types of variation are you going to find? You you could find one maybe six inches under the ground, and you could find one that's six feet, right? You bet. Uh, the original monument might have been set, and you know you can see the one there in the upper left corner. Um, oh, it's short, but he's not that short. He's um, but the road's been built and they paved over the top of it and that monument was probably five feet under the ground. And then, uh, you know, we live in Colorado, it snows, sometimes you've got to go out and dig for it. Uh, there's one there in the upper right that shows it pretty close, but it was in pavement and it was buried underneath that pavement. So you got to go in, you got to chip away at that asphalt. It's not easy to get to all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one right below it again, same same kind of deal. And then uh, there are some areas you get up in the northern Weld County where there's some really wicked terrain. That one in the bottom middle, and uh, you know it's not easy to to get around in areas like that. But the surveyors, 150 years ago, they placed them where they were supposed to be. As long as there was no water, they they put it where it was supposed to be. So it's probably down in that ravine somewhere. And Sometimes it is on a rock cliff, man. And uh, well, yeah, that gets kind of hairy. That's scary stuff. I mean, uh, I'll and it's funny because the the one that's up there in the top middle with the snow there, I'm gonna just take a wild guess that that ground that's underneath the 
you know, four feet of snow there is probably not the softest stuff in the in the world, right? Generally not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that ground is pretty hard. And so, what are you using to pull up these monuments? Uh, obviously, you can see that you're digging there. What are you using to dig up these monuments? Uh, whatever we can, a uh, shovel, a pickaxe. Uh, if we could, we'd probably take a blowtorch out there and defrost the ground, but uh, we generally can't carry one of those with us. But uh, whatever you, you know, we use chisels. Yeah, anything you can to break up that. And I imagine in some cases it's as, as hard as concrete. Some and and it, yeah, and, and if it, it's delicate when you get close to it, you don't want to disturb that monument or destroy the the top of it. So. Uh, in some ways, it's like being an archaeologist. You, you dig until you get close, and then, you know, we don't go as far as getting out the the brush to to get that bone out or anything. But uh, well, and you can see up in the top right, there's a monument there. We call those taps, right? So you've got that's more of a modern technique, obviously. But you've also got old monuments out there too, right? I mean, you've got in some of these areas up in north. Northwell County, um, you know, on the Colorado Wyoming kind of border area, you know, some of those areas, I imagine you're going to find some, or, or if you're in Wyoming or in just some of those areas, you're going to find some old monuments, right? Yeah. Uh, they, a lot of the monuments that they set 150 years ago were stones. And you can see on some of these, they've got little notches on them, and that told them how far away they were, excuse me, from the east or south edge of the township. Uh, depending on where those notches were on the face of the stone. And uh, other ones were putting a, a, a large stick in the ground. Maybe they ran out of stone, so they put in that uh, branch. And then other ones were charred stakes or, or piles of rocks there in the uh, stone mounds in the bottom right. But that's, that's a lot of the ways. Um, Used to look like that around Denver, but you know we've had development and and everything. So now everything's a lot of it's aluminum caps, brass caps. Sure. Well, obviously there's a lot that goes into section breakdown. Um, last question for you on this, and then we'll move to the next one. Is if I asked you to go out into you know a township and I just picked a, a two sections and I said. Uh, I need you to go break down these two sections in this particular township. Let's just—it it could be any township, any section. And I said, uh, "Can you, I need you to give me an exact cost for what that's going to be? Would you be able to do it?" I could not. Why? Just because I don't know what section monuments are still there and what doesn't exist. There's, unfortunately, without going out there, I, I can't know exactly how long it's going to take. If all the monuments are there, it would go pretty fast. But if some of them are gone and I need to establish them via, via other methods, um, there's, there's no telling how long that extra cost could be. Sure. Yeah, so you have no idea what's out there, um, what you may have to just verify, how you would have to verify. You're going to have to dig six feet. Are you going to have to reestablish a monument? Uh, you know, are you potentially going to be looking for rocks with notches in them? Are you, is the weather going to play into it where you might be digging for two hours on something that might have taken 15 minutes during the summer? So a lot of, a lot of factors, a lot of variables. That, a lot of variables. Okay. Um, so let's talk about construction staking. So once you've got some section breakdown, you've established kind of where those monuments are. And now why you're going to use those monuments is, so you, is that so you can kind of triangulate off of that to, understand the area? Um, well, the section monuments, like I said, it helps um, subdividing that into either smaller pieces or a lot of the subdivisions around here are done in some portion of a section or an entire section. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you get into a, a house lot and it's not a perfect square or a rectangle, you know, curved roads, cul-de-sacs, Sure. Yep. And then ultimately, once you figure that out, uh, you're going to have to do this service called construction staking. So help us out. What is construction staking? You know, why is it used, and how does it help the the project? What is what is what function is it serving on on the project? The the construction staking makes sure that everything gets built 
where it's supposed to be built. Uh, doesn't always happen. Um, you know, some contractors don't understand what you were staking or um, things get bumped and they don't ask the surveyor to come out and, and, and restake it for them. But uh, what, do, what do you mean bumped? Um, well, I've personally gone out and staked something for the land developer on one day and then somebody comes through that afternoon with a grader and then the guy that was going to place that storm drain in the ground can't find the stakes that I put in because the grader came by and took out my stakes. Got it. Okay. So the, the guy that's putting in the storm drain, he says, well, I still got this stake and that stake. I'm just going to put it in from those. And then it turns out to not be right. Right. Okay. So, uh, but construction staking, make sure that things get put into the ground and built as closely to the plans as possible. Okay. I mean, I've, over the years as a kid, I never knew what these things were. I'm sure I pulled a few of them out and played, you know, sword fighting with them uh, on, on occasion. But these wood stakes here, this is what we're talking about when we say staking, right, is these wood stakes or lath. Um, what are the, the flags that are on there? You see these colored kind of ribbons that are on there. Um, it's just a way to draw attention to it that it is a surveyed position. Sometimes uh, some surveyors or some contractors will want certain colors to mean certain things. Um, I've, for instance, I've used blue as a water stake, green as a sewer stake, um, white as a storm drain, but different contractors or different surveyors use different colors here. It's orange and this looks like a curved stake to me and it's a three foot offset that's up there at the top, and then the BC is for back a curb, and then from the the nail or whatever, it's a, a fill of 0 0.68 feet to that back a curb. So the, all that information is right there for the contractor. Now he knows to pull a tape three feet away and and go up um, three quarters or uh, two thirds of a foot, and then that's where his back curb is. So surveys coming in, and um, and it, that's why again that accuracy is extremely important because they're putting something in the ground to say this is exactly where it is, this is where it needs to go, um, this is how much dirt you may have to remove um, for a completely separate con you know construction company to come in or an earth removal company or whatever um, that's going to be coming in after that. You've got two completely different entities, companies working together. Um, a lot of detail and accuracy has to be put in place here, right, in order for this to be built correctly. Yep, and yeah, and the accuracy part, you know, here on the Eastern Plains, we it's, it's kind of flat, and we don't put a lot of slope on our road. Sometimes it, it's as little as a half a percent, and half a percent is not much. That's a half a foot over 100 feet, and, you know, we put our stakes 25 feet apart, and if you don't have the right elevations on there or it's not built correctly, the water's not going to flow right. Okay. And when you've got a half percent, water's got to flow in the right direction. Okay. All right, so let's move on to uh, as built. So we talked about topographic survey, kind of on the front end, getting the planning uh, pieces of those. Uh, we, you know, we talked about the, um, you know, going through and doing that section breakdown piece to make sure that all you're tying everything to the monuments, you know exactly where it's at. Uh, and then the construction staking. So then that leads us to this as-built. So you hear this term a lot. What does as-built mean and why is it useful on projects? As-built is how was this constructed? You know, plans are put together on how to build something, but nothing ever goes to plan. Very seldom does it go to plan. So you always want to do an as-built survey after it's done. How was it built? Um, and that's really important, especially for something like what you see here in the bottom right. Uh, things change, technology changes, um, they want to expand a site, this is an oil and gas um, site of some sort, and they might want to expand it, so how is it built, where, when I go to design something that I'm going to expand this on, where can I connect to? Okay, so this term as built, you know, if you just kind of listen to it as it as it's stated there, it would seem to me that you're surveying as the actual building or whatever it is is being built. Um, but you're saying that this happens a lot of times just on the back end of it. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. For residential subdivisions, the, the the whole street will be done, and then you'll come in afterwards and determine how it was built. How is that water going to flow in the curb and gutter? Uh, we'll dip the manholes and and make sure that the inverts are correct on a sewer line. You would think that especially on a sewer line, why don't I just do it right after they put it in the ground? Right. Well, sometimes these sewer lines here in Colorado are 15 feet deep because we have basements. And I can take a shot on it before they fill it, but when you put 15 feet of dirt on it, things tend to settle a little bit. So where I took the shot before they put dirt on it, where I take the shot after the dirt's put on can be significantly different sometimes. When so, you say take a shot, you're talking about what? Going out with my instrument and and getting that location okay. the GPS horizontally and vertically. Okay, like a GPS coordinate. Uh, yeah, whether it's GPS or traditional survey methods using uh -huh. a total station. Yep. Okay. Um, so you go in. Uh, how often does it happen where what you built when you do the as built that that actually matches the original design perfectly? How often does that happen? Not, well, exactly. I'm going to say next to never because construction methods are not perfect. Surveying methods are not perfect. I mean, we have tolerances in the in the survey community, so um, it, it's almost never. And even an as-built survey is not going to be exact, but it's going to be better than the plans. At least you have a good idea of where it is after. Um, but you know, I would say. I don't even want to put a percentage to it. <laughs> <laughs> but you think, you know, on the front end, if you're using it for planning, using it for design, using it, you know, all the way through, that when you do the as built, it would, it should certainly match. But obviously, we see that doesn't happen a lot, right? Yeah. It's different. It could be close, and it could be way off. There could have been conditions in the field that they had to field fit something, mm -hmm. and it's completely different than what the plan was. You know, and it never went through a redesign phase. The the contractor just said, I don't have time to wait for them to redesign this thing. I'm gonna route this pipe this way. And you know. So really you're hoping at the end for either a yeah, okay, that that that'll work, um, rather than a oh boy, like that that's gonna be a <laughs> this as built is quite a bit off. And that yeah, yeah. that could be pretty timely and expensive. Okay. So you know, we've talked a lot about the history and where it's come from. We've talked about, you know, uh, different types of surveying. So let's just take a quick second to talk about the future of land surveying. So you've been in surveying for, you know, 90 plus years, uh, Michael. Maybe you, you could, you know, bring, but you've also been on the on the cutting edge of a lot of the new types of technology that's being used. So um, help me out. Tell me kind of where do you see the future of land surveying going? All right. Well, first of all, it's been more around. 25 oh, okay. years, Sorry. <laughs> maybe 30, I can't remember back that far. Um, but yeah, I mean, I learned on some traditional equipment transits, and, and I grew up through the age of total stations and then robotic total stations now, and, and, and then we've got GPS, which makes it really cool. We, we can go out with uh, and, and get our information from the satellites and locate something. Um, levels help us certainly on in areas where things are flat and we need to, to make sure that the elevations are really tight. Um, 3D laser scanning, um, it, it's been around for 10, 15, 20 years, but it's really making make, made some strides in the last five or so, the, 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 the technology and and how fast and, and accurately it can gather that data. It, the, some of the original scanners were like 50 points a second, and now we're up in the area of a million points a second. Mm -hmm. uh, and then UAVs, um, I mean, those, it's been two or three years that those have been making strides in surveying. We used to send up uh, a Cessna plane or something like that and get aerial images. And, and get our surveying that way. Now we're doing with these little tiny helicopters or these um, little fixed wing aircraft that we just send up, get a small area, and then it comes back down and we do our own aerial imagery now. Yeah, and it's it's uh, obviously compared to conventional aircraft, you know, where you, you can just send it up and 
you know, an hour as opposed to having to plan that out for weeks. And obviously, there's a big cost cost difference there, right? And you know, ultimately, being able to get you're flying at 400 feet above the ground, 350 feet above the ground compared to you know a couple thousand potentially. Um, so obviously, I, I would imagine you can get some you know some really good accuracy um, that you might not be able to get. The 3D laser scanning there just you know, for the purposes of, of this presentation, which we're not going to go into in detail, but we're talking about LIDAR, right? Um, light detection and ranging, which is similar to sonar, similar to uh, radar, where it's sending out a pulse and getting a return. Only in this case, we're talking about sending out millions of different pulses, right? And ultimately creating this 3D visualization. So, you know, what this new technology is, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of moving from this 2D environment into a 3D environment where now you get these 3D surface models and uh, 3D point clouds that you can do all kinds of things with, right? Yeah, I, mean, I, I call 3D laser scanning or, or HDS, I, I call it um, like GPS on steroids, where we used to go out and get a shot at the bottom of a tree to, and then we use our, our comments and everything in our field book and okay, this is a 12 inch tree, and maybe get a couple shots on the drip line. Um, 3D laser scanning gets the entire tree. Gets it all. Gets every single yeah. bit, every every millimeter um, out there. And that's kind of the big idea, right? Is that now what these tools are able to do is is get more information. And we'll talk about that in a second. When you look, when you talk about conventional versus using UAVs or drones, you know you can use those terms synonymously. That's the same same thing. Uh, and LIDAR, we're talking about, is it a fair statement to say that you're, we're talking about gathering a tremendous amount of data more than what you'd be able to get conventionally? Absolutely. Uh, you know, like I said, conventional surveying, there, there's a, a good typical grid survey you go out, going out to get the, the topography of an open field or something. Depending on the, the, the visual relief on there, we might do a 50-foot grid or a 25 or even sometimes a 100-foot grid. And even there, and inside, there's, there's little undulations that you can't get. You'd be out there all day trying to do that by hand. And with LiDAR, it gathers the data so fast right. that you get what you see there and the, the, the relief in the bottom right that what you didn't get on the 50-foot grid, you see a lot more in that on the the LIDAR or the UAV. Yeah, and you take out the guessing game of what's out there, right? You know, it's not straight lines. We all know it's not just straight lines out there. Um, it's, there are going to be those undulations. So knowing exactly what's there, um, but it doesn't take any more time. In fact, it probably takes less field time um, to gather that amount of information now than somebody walking around with a, a GPS um, data card, right? Absolutely. And then ultimately, you know, so we talk about gathering more data uh, using UAVs and as, a, as an example, though, it's also collecting um, more area. So this is a, an example of, that's actually about a thousand acres there that uh, we as a company collected in about three hours with UAVs and really providing two different benefits here. One is on the left there, what you see, uh, this is what we call an orthomosaic. You know, you could be talking about hundreds or thousands of pictures that are stitched together. And ultimately, you're going to get the most up-to-date aerial imagery that's out there, right? Which is huge because now we're not, it's not a guessing game. We're not using Google Earth that could be three months or three years old. We're talking about knowing exactly what's out there. So here in Colorado, we have a lot of development going on, a lot of new uh, housing communities going in. So, you know, the difference of looking at Google Earth that could be two years old and knowing that there's an actual housing community going in there could be a really big deal, right? Or Texas, where there's a lot of oil and gas, new locations going in every single day, new pipelines being put in place every day, to be able to see a pipeline scar or an above-ground gathering line or something like that is very important, right? So just having that on the left, the up-to-date aerial imagery, I would think would be really important, right? And especially if you're an engineer or you're a surveyor. Yeah, I mean, from where I started out, like I said, we'd send up a big plane, and, and that was really expensive. So most of the time, we didn't even do aerial imagery. Uh, we just relied on what we could get, shooting stuff on the ground. And then the internet came along, and Google Earth came along, and we thought, wow, now we've got some. We can see what it looks like from the ground. We can add some some background 
to our, our drawings. And yeah, that's two or three years old. And uh, I've had many instances where I've used Google Earth and, and then we go out there and it's completely different because like you said, the development's happened and it's just, it's not the same anymore. So being able to send up a small drone and get these images in a short amount of time has been a huge help. Well, and it's not just the aerial imagery, right? We're also gathering data out there. So it's not just flying, getting some nice, pretty pictures of what's out there now. We're also getting data. So that, as you can see on the right side there, now we're looking at the topography that we talked about earlier and, and getting those contours. And so now we know what the Earth is doing on a thousand acres, as opposed to no one's going to pay a surveyor to go collect a thousand acres. Um, unless they're going to build on a thousand acres. If they're just going to be using up a hundred of those, they're just going to have you go survey the hundred acres. Um, but then, you know, plans change and surveyors go back out. We know this, you know, Michael, you know this as well as I do. I mean, we we get called that back out to the same location five, six, seven times uh, to survey the same exact location because plans change. You know, that oil and gas pad moves, uh, you know, 200 feet to the right. Now we got to go survey out and find out what that topography looks like and everything. And so, you know, being able to gather all this on the front end and getting these uh, features that are there, you know, the, the cultural information that's out there and, and establishing the setbacks, well, now when those things change, we can pull it up on a computer, right? Instead of sending a survey crew back out, which extends timelines, adds additional costs to the project, we can just pull up this data on our computers and decide, well, where do we want to go? Do we want to go, we can't go, you know, 200 feet to the east because it's too steep of a grade. We can't go to the north. There's a building unit. Maybe we'll just go 300 feet to the south or 400 feet to the west. And those are our options. So where do you, where do you want to go with it? Yeah, I like to call that uh, collateral data. You know, we've all heard of collateral damage. You know, you wanted to blow up this building, and you know, something over there got hit too. You didn't intend for it, but it happened. Um, that's the great thing about aerial surveying and HDS. Uh, laser scanning is you get a lot of collateral data is what I like to call it. You didn't intend to get that data. You didn't need that data at the time, but like you said, plans change and because of the, the method that you use to gather that data, you already have it. Yeah, and that, that makes a huge difference on the efficiencies of these different projects. Um, you know, what we're, we're going to take a look at here, and this may be a little grainy for the folks watching on the webinar, um, but it's very smooth on the computer here. It's just sometimes through the webinar, it doesn't come through as close. What we're looking at here is a 3D point cloud. So yes, it looks like a drone is just flying around, taking this nice video, and it's not. This is actually a 3D point cloud. This is all data that we're actually looking at. This is all data that we can measure based off of, um, but we're also able to get that visual, that 3D visualization, which is extremely helpful for lots of different purposes. We've figured out probably 10 or 15 uh, different purposes for using this type of data. But to be able to get this amount of area and then pick, uh, why we call it a fly-through is because we're choosing to fly through this big point cloud um, at this particular angle, but you could go at any angle. We could go all the way directly above it, look at it from the side, look at it kind of from this view going around in a circle, um, lots of different ways. but. I mean, when you started your career in surveying, I mean, did you have anything like this that, that you could use? Or, and, and if not, you know, where would it have provided some benefits? Uh, I can only do this with my dad's plane. You know, he, right? We'd go up and take some pictures. Nothing like this when I first started surveying. So. Um, the, the, the technology and the fact that, that this is not just the actual footage from the drone. This is this is a fly through of the data that was captured. Right. Uh, it, it's just it's a, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, your technology is gone. <clears throat> you're talking about looking at a thousand acres and, and a visual example here that could you know potentially be let's call it spot you know spot on if not maybe a tenth horizontally maybe two to three tenths vertically. I mean, that's amazing on, on this amount of area. Uh, a lot of quick decisions can be made when you have that actual data at your fingertips. Yeah, and, and that accuracy, you know, when we did a 
we saw that 50-foot grid back there a couple slides ago. Um, in those days, we figured any contour that was drawn from that was within about six inches. You know, and now, you know, we say that this data is accurate to within a couple of tenths. That's even more accurate than what we had before, even though the point that we shot on that 50-foot grid was a little more accurate. We didn't have any data in between there, but now we've got data in between those to a greater accuracy than we could claim our old-style methods of surveying. Yes, so this, you know, it, it definitely has been a, a huge change, you know, moving, moving to this 3D environment. I think, um, obviously, there's good marketing purposes that this can be used for. You know, you think about going into a new project and you take something like what's on the ground there, overlay your design plans on top of that, say this is what it's going to look like and give somebody a 3D visual and a video like this and say this is what it'll look like. Or, you know, pre-construction, post-construction, uh, maybe progress reporting through and show this is basically the evolution of that project. This is what it's looked like as it's gone through. There's a lot of different ways. Um, a lot of people like to see these, right? New communities are being built. Uh, if there's a new target going in or a new oil and gas pad, people want to see, well, what's that going to look like from our, from our, my house, you know, my back porch. So having that visual, obviously, is, is also helpful from a marketing perspective. Yeah, if we can take that design and, and put it on top of that right there to give people a really nice, um, what's it going to look like? So that is, uh, that is a, uh, a quick kind of cert land surveying 101. Uh, for any of the folks now, we'll be taking questions again on the top right-hand corner. If you hit that orange arrow, you can leave a question. We've had a few that have been uh, sent in while we've been talking about this. So uh, the first one uh, that we've got here is calculation of points. Explain what that means. Calculations of points. So I'm guessing they're talking about, yeah, calculating points, right? Yeah, I had um, a lot of times, especially for construction staking, an engineer designs something and then the surveyor is going to take his engineering plans and we're going to calculate points so that we can go out and perform that construction staking. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also calculate points when we're doing section breakdown. If we've got some of the corners but we can't find another one, maybe we'll We'll calculate where we think it should be. And sometimes we were just searching in the wrong area based on other monumentation around, and then when we get a more accurate calculation on that, we, we find the original monument. Is there a danger to calcing points if you're doing, you know, like section breakdown as an example? No, there's never a danger in calcing points unless you calc it wrong. Or what if you're calcing off of something that you haven't verified is actually there? Then there's definitely a danger. Okay. So, you know, obviously, and, and let's, you know, we can just kind of put this out there. There probably are some firms that are out there, that survey firms, that have maybe surveyed an area 20 years ago and did find a monument 20 years ago, but have not gone back out to re-verify that that's there, uh, and maybe possibly calcing points off of a, a monument that maybe doesn't exist there anymore. Is there, there's a danger in that then? Absolutely. Uh, things could have happened in the last 20 years. Maybe that first monument wasn't in the, the location where it should have been. Uh, other things have come to light that uh, the actual monument was 50 feet to the west because somebody didn't take into account uh, a roadway that was dedicated 50 years ago. I mean, is it kind of safe to say that surveyors, for I guess lack of a better term, they're following in the footsteps of previous surveyors and and kind of verifying that what should be there is there, and if it's not, then... Yeah. As, as surveyors, we do a lot of following. We, we follow all of the surveyors that have gone before us, and we hope that those surveyors before us left us a good uh, bread trail. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And if they do, it makes our investigation a lot easier, and if they don't, then... Uh, we just we kind of start the investigation all over again to reestablish what what should be there. Okay, uh, so let's move on to the next question. So this question says, why would you not, or why would you want to use two different land surveyors on a job? We've had these in the past. What are the pros and cons? 
Uh, the pros, if, if there's some kind of a, a contention as to the location of a boundary line, um, no two surveyors are going to come up to the same, come with the same solution. Uh, a lot of surveying is, is based on opinion, professional opinion, and sometimes we'll come up with the same solution, but a lot of times we don't. We might be a little bit different. Um, someone might find a piece of um, recorded evidence, and another surveyor may find someone something that wasn't recorded. So um, that there, if there's a, a land contention, then there's an, possibly an advantage to having a second opinion, just like with a doctor. Okay. You know, if he tells you that there's something wrong, uh, well, yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to go get a second opinion. You know, and he may tell you, no, there's nothing wrong, or he may tell you, yep. The first guy, he was right. So um, the cons to, to having a, a second surveyor, a second opinion on your surveying, depending on the reason, it's just an added cost that you don't really need to bear. Mm -hmm. So, well, what what if you had a, a surveyor on the front end doing you know part of the topographic, the planning, and then somebody else that's on the back end doing you know construction staking or the as built. Well, your con there is you're you're adding another surveyor that's not familiar with the project, mm -hmm. and and then they've got to go out if if they're a good reputable survey their surveyor they're going to go out and establish either their own control network or verify your control network, uh, so they're just doubling up on the work that you originally did, so uh, that's an added cost that you don't really need to that the developer shouldn't have to bear. Yeah, well, and, and I would imagine, too, if you've got two different folks working on it and then something goes wrong, you know, who's who's to blame? Where do you point the finger there if you've got multiple surveyors? I imagine one's going to point the finger at the other one, um, and, and that can get kind of sticky. Yep. Um, okay, so just two more here. One, uh, survey inches. How are these different? Survey inches or survey feet? I guess. Surveyors don't use inches. Oh, okay. Good. Um, there is, uh, believe it or not, there's an international foot and a U.S. survey foot. Uh, they don't differ by a lot. If on a, a ruler, it's pretty much the same, but uh, they do differ when you get on a long distance. Uh, I can't remember the, the exact difference off the top of my head, but uh, here in the U.S., obviously, we use a U.S. survey foot. There are some states, I believe, Montana is one of them that uses an international foot. And so uh, we know a, a regular foot to be 12 inches, you know, and, and but what, then how big would a survey foot be? It's still roughly 12 inches. Okay. I mean, the, there's a fraction of a, like I said, on a ruler, you're not going to be able to tell the difference, but it's when you get out on a long distance that you, if you're in international or U.S. survey foot, uh, but generally, a surveyor does not work in inches. We, when we break it down below a foot, we'll go down to the tenth of a foot. Okay. Okay. And then to the hundredth. When you say a tenth, you're talking about there's ten survey inches, for lack of a better way of putting that, in a regular 12-inch foot? Yeah, it's divided, a foot is divided into By 12. ten segments. Instead of 12. Instead of 12. Okay. And then we'll break it down, break that down into tens for a hundred. So then it's broken down into a, hundred, a foot is broken down into a hundred different pieces. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, last question here. Why is it that you can find six different monuments at the same exact location? Well, like I mentioned, no two surveyors have the same opinion of where something is. Um, and when you get into that, what we call pin cushioning, uh, it, it's usually you've got surveyors that just they think their position's a little more accurate than yours. Where generally the, it's just that you know the accuracy of the equipment, the the way that that surveyor interpreted it, instead of um, one surveyor saying, "Okay, I found this monument. It's a foot different than where I think it is." He goes and he puts in his own monument instead of just saying, all right, I found this monument, and my my opinion is a, is a foot different or something like that. And, yeah. So is it possible to, to go out there and say, 
here's two different monuments. Let's say there's an error that something's been built wrong. Uh, two different surveyors have been involved, and one surveyed this area, one surveyed this area. They both use the same section corner. Um, is it fair to say that they could both be correct and they could both be wrong? Yes. <laughs> That's really confusing. Yeah. Um, you know, you could have you got two surveyors with two different monuments. You could bring in two more surveyors, and they could say that one of them is right. You know, one says that one's right, one says the other one's right. So, like I said, it's all up to professional opinion, and you just gotta. Then it's up to the lawyers to decide who actually is right. Clear as mud. Yep. So as long as you have evidence, as long as you can show what you did to prove why that was the monument that you chose and why that was the, the spot that you picked, then that's really what it's about, right? Is, is tracing your steps and showing your math, as they say in grade school, right? Yeah. Leaving those, like I mentioned before, leaving those breadcrumbs. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Not only for surveyors who are coming behind you, but for yourself, you know, so that you know how I did it and so that if you do have to, to explain to someone, you can show them on paper how you came to that conclusion. Okay. Well, great. Well, you're off the hot seat, Michael. I really appreciate the, the help. This was extremely educational uh, for everybody, I think, on, on the line here and certainly for me. Appreciate your expertise and uh, thanks again. Maybe we'll do this again sometime. I look forward to it. Yeah, great. Thanks again, Michael. All right. You're welcome. Uh, to everyone, this concludes our webinar. Thanks again for joining and uh, we'll see you next time.